Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Michelle Grover, Twilio Chief Information Officer. We are lucky to have with us today Audrey Tang, Taiwan's first ever digital minister. During this session, we'll talk about innovation and in digital communications, free software, how Taiwan leverages these tools to facilitate collaboration and transparency between the government and its citizens. We will also highlight how Audrey used open data to hack the COVID-19 pandemic early on, and it allowed the Taiwanese citizens to have access to PPE. And with that, I'd like to welcome Audrey. Hi, Audrey. Hello, good local time, everyone. Thank you. I wanted to ask you a few questions. So I wanted to start with one. Uh, can you walk us through the story of how you became Taiwan's first digital minister? Certainly. Uh, back in 2014, uh, we occupied the parliament for three weeks. Um, as you can see here at the time, uh, I was helping the cable power and radio team uh, to make sure that in the occupied Congress, not only we have a live feed, video feed, but also transcripts, translations, and things like that. We even set up a kind of transparent wall uh, outside of the occupied parliament. So half a million people on the street, many more online can participate in what's happening uh, in that occupy. So why would they would occupy the parliament? Because at the time, the students were protesting that we were um, being handed this cross-strait service and trade agreement uh, with Beijing with no uh, substantial deliberation. So the idea is that because the MPs were on strike, so we took their office to do their work for them, or so the legitimacy theory goes. Uh, and after three weeks of thoroughly nonviolent occupying the parliamentarian areas, uh, we actually managed to converge on a set of consensus, 40 months, uh, not, not one less, uh, and they got accepted by the head of the parliament. And so the politics in Taiwan really changed because this demonstration is not protest anymore, it's a demo. It demos that with sufficient ICT technology, people can listen at scale. And so at the end of that year, all the mayors that supported open government gets elected and all the mayor that didn't, well, didn't. Uh, I was then hired as a young reverse mentor, that is to say people under 35 years old, advising the minister of the future direction of the country. Uh, and then I work with Minister Jacqueline Tsai at the moment, um, with the, um, you know, uh, maybe Uber case, the Airbnb case, Bitcoin, um, online liquor sales, things like that, uh, making sure that the digital economy uh, and the uh, Regulations, the rec tech uh, and the um, gov tech uh, can evolve with the civic technologies. So I work as kind of like an understudy for a year and a half. And then when Dr. Tsai Ing-wen became our president, I get promoted, I guess, from an intern to a full minister. Wow, that is amazing. Um, another question. So in you know, 2020 has just been a life altering year for many around the world in a number of different ways. How do you uh, see your role as digital minister of Taiwan? How do you see the impact um, on communications between the Taiwanese government and its people? Yeah, definitely. I think in Taiwan, uh, we managed to fight off the pandemic uh, with no lockdowns um, and also the infodemic uh, with no takedowns. And these twin um, emics uh, are really uh, the pillars of the social innovation and where it shines. Um, we have this interesting idea called humor over rumor uh, that makes sure that the scientific knowledge, for example, this is the spokesdog of our Ministry of Health and Welfare. In each ministry, we have communication officers. Usually we have officers that talk to the media, to the parliamentarians, but we also have participation officers that talk to essentially hashtags. Uh, and then these hashtag officers uh, use everything from cute dog and cats and other internet memes to make sure that people feel engaged whenever there is a anxiety, a conspiracy theory that shares and travels an outrage. We push out a meme after at most two hours that travels on cuteness and on humor and has a higher R value than the conspiracy theory. So physical distancing, if you're outdoor, you know, keep uh, the two Shiba Inus away from each other. If you're indoor, keep three Shiba Inus. Uh, remember to cover your mouth and nose when sneezing. Remember to wear your masks. But why do you wear your masks? Because it protects you from your own unwashed hands, so on and so forth. So the idea of humor over rumor really builds a very quick iteration cycle. And those humor are actually crowdsourced. Everybody can call this toll-free number 1922 and share 
whatever they think is a uh, better meme to amplify to the whole society in the next day's live streamed conference from the Central Epidemic Command Center. For example, back in April, there was a young boy that called saying, hey, I don't want to go to school anymore because you're rationing masks and all I get is pink medical mask and I don't get to pick the color and I'm afraid that my classmates may laugh at me for wearing pink as a boy. And the very next day, everybody in the CEC's conference, including our minister Chen Shizhong, wore pink medical masks. And so suddenly the boy become the most hip boy because only he <laughs> has the color that the heroes wear. Uh, and the minister even said that Pink Panther is my favorite childhood hero or something like that. And so this basically uh, shows a trust from the government to the citizens when it comes to the three pillars of uh, radical social innovation that is fast, that is fair, and is fun. Well, and it's engaging too, right? You feel connected, you feel engaged, you feel cared about. I can only imagine how how super happy that little boy was that day. He was very, very popular, I'm sure, for that day. Um, what are some of the aspects of digital innovation that have helped transform uh, Taiwan's communication strategy? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, aside from the cute talk and the humor over rumor, um, I think it's also important to have a legal definition of this information. Because this information and speech freedom, of course, uh, in Taiwan are a hotly debated topic. And according to the Human Rights Watch Group, Civicus Monitor, Taiwan is the only country in Asia that has a completely open in terms of the freedom of the press, of speech, and so on, of assembly, um, compared to any other Asian country, uh, along with New Zealand, if you count the Pacific. Uh, and so in this environment, we cannot do a administrative takedown. It's not imaginable. But yet, uh, there are, of course, deliberate attempts uh, to influence, for example, elections, public health, and things like that. So we have a legal definition of this information that says uh, this information is defined as intentional untruth that harms the public welfare. That is to say, it doesn't uh, need to be disinformation if it just harms the image of the minister because that's just good journalism. But if it harms the public, then it falls outside the freedom of the speech and therefore could be prosecuted. I will use one example. Um, there was a time uh, back uh, in April uh, where people rushed to buy tissue papers. And why do they do that? Because we're ramping up, up the mask production from 2 million a day to 20 million a day. And people can see very clearly from the civic technologist dashboards. And then a rumor says, and I quote, all the materials that's going to be made uh, into medical masks originally came from the tissue paper factories. So we run out of tissue paper soon, rush out and buy, unquote. And that, of course, travels an outrage, maybe have an R value of three and people uh, share it. Uh, but after uh, only a couple hours, our premier, Su Zhenchang, as you can see here, pushes out this fantastic meme. So this is a uh, wordplay, and this is packaged literally as a tissue paper box, uh, where you see a tissue paper here. You see the backside of our premier, uh, his bottom wiggling it a little bit. Uh, and then uh, a large font that says, uh, each of us only have one pair of buttocks. It's a wordplay because button twin <laughs> in Mandarin sounds the same as to stockpile twin. Uh, and so it's saying, you know, it doesn't pay to stockpile because you're not going to use that much. Uh, and then a table that says tissue paper came from South American materials, while medical paper came from domestic materials. <clears throat> and so everybody who laughed at that was, it's literally impossible to feel outrage about the conspiracy theory because these are mutually exclusive pathways in their mind. Uh, and this maybe has a R value of seven, like on average, each person shared to seven other people uh, every hour. And so after just a couple of days, the conspiracy theory died down. And of course, the prosecution of the people who intentionally share it at the beginning, not the people who share, but the people who fabricate this, um, it's done because they were tissue paper resellers, go figure. Uh, and so that is one counter disinformation strategy uh, deployed in place. That is absolutely great. <laughs> um, we need to borrow some of these here. I'm just, I just need to put that out there. Um, <laughs> can you tell us a bit about uh, how you utilize software too to communicate the availability of PPE um, during the ongoing COVID outbreak and how you think that other countries and companies can leverage, can leverage uh, similar technologies as well? 
Yeah, definitely. Um, in Taiwan, when we are distributing the PPEs in the pharmacies, of course, the pharmacists are professional, they're trusted uh, by the community and so on. But a big problem is that people maybe have to go to four different pharmacies before they encounter one that still have the PPEs in stock mm -hmm. because they're uh, rationing. Uh, there's a limited quota every day. And so there is a very interesting innovation, not done by the government, but by the civic technologist, the name is Howard Wu from Tainan City. He drew a map where people can voluntarily report how many masks are there in each store. And then we uh, see this. This is excellent. The media loves it. Uh, the only problem is that he owed Google uh, 20K US dollars in map uh, API usage fees after mm -hmm. just a couple of days. So he had to take it down. Uh, but to his rescue, um, is the civic tech community called GovZero or G0V. This community, which I'm a part of, uh, systemically take all the government website, like join the gov.tw, which is a participation portal, and make better alternative versions. The call to action is called fork the government, important pronunciation, fork the government. Uh, and so the idea is that you change the O to a zero. And if you replace the O to a zero, then you get into the shadow government that is always open source, always more engaging, and have a amplified collective intelligence of the civic technologist. And so um, how we ask on Gov Zero, can anyone you know, help us uh, to get the real-time PPE availability and also reduce the Google API costs? And of course, people from OpenStreetMap community and so on contributed uh, to his work. But also, uh, I take a look at his work and talk to our premier. And the premier, Su Jinsang, said, of course, we need to trust citizens with open data. And so we published every 30 seconds that becomes open API, not just open data, of each and every pharmacy's availability. So for example, nowadays, you can take your national health insurance card, the NHI card, to any pharmacy and collect nine medical masks per two weeks if you're an adult or 10 if you are a child. And the person queuing after you will be able actually to just refresh their phone and see that this actually comes from 58 to 49 right after your purchase. Uh, and so there's a participatory accountability that builds trust from citizen to citizens instead of asking citizens to uh, you know, blindly trust the state. This makes the state transparent to the citizen, not the other way around. And we have more than 100 different tools that even people with uh, seeing difficulty or color blindness and so on can talk to chatbots and voice assistant because it's all open data. And this gets uh, adapted by the Korean um, civic technologists. I just met a few of them a week ago. Some of them were just 14 years old and so on. Uh, they uh, you know, don't speak Mandarin and Finjian Kiang from Tainan and Haru doesn't speak Korean, but they both speak JavaScript, so that's not a problem. Uh, and so they asked their government to publish under our own um, API, the open API standard. Uh, and then the first map that worked uh, in Korea was actually from Tainan City. Uh, and so this is a great international collaboration based on the idea of radically trusting the citizens. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. Um, in the next 10 years, how do you predict that software and digital innovation will impact global communications and society as a whole, actually? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, this is a great question. So I like to um, show you my office. This is literally my office. Um, so this is the Social Innovation Lab in Taipei, the heart of Taipei City. We tore down all the walls. It's literally a park. Anybody and their dog and their self-driving vehicles uh, can travel <laughs> to the place and talk about the digitization, the yeah. innovation, the governance, and the inclusion uh, of those emerging technologies. And the great thing about this place is that in Taiwan, we have broadband as a human right. So anywhere in Taiwan, even on the top of Taiwan, the Yushan Mountain, almost 4,000 meters high, you have 10 megabits per second in just 15, US dollars per month, unlimited data connection. And if you don't, it's my fault, personally. Uh, and so anywhere in Taiwan, you can connect to the Social Innovation Lab and participate in my office hours. 
and everything is radically transparent on the record. And I actually seek out the places least connected to Taipei, our capital city, like the rural indigenous uh, with cultural translators and so on, and participate in their town halls. But I'm the only one that travels, that facilitates. But I connect back to the lab with 12 different ministries, section chiefs or higher, so that they see before their own eyes the stories of people, their struggles, their innovations, and so on. It is called our social innovation tours. Now, with the pandemic, it seems that we this is not limited to Taiwan anymore. Everywhere, even very senior officials, previously, you know, not very believing or trusting the video conferencing, uh, suddenly discovered that it's as easy as opening up your browser and you can actually look at each other and have a better communication as opposed to face to face because you have to wear a mask when you meet face to face. Uh, and so because of this, we managed to hold this kind of video conference, for example, a few days before the World Health Assembly with 14 different economies uh, and to talk about, for example, the humor over rumor playbook, the Taiwan model and things like that. And we get to meet uh, with quite senior officials, me uh, medical officers and things like that, totally transcending the boundaries uh, of nations. And because of that, I think uh, this will help us a lot because then we can talk about climate change, about the disinformation crisis, um, quantum cryptography, um, and things like that. All the worldwide issues using this uh, feeling of international solidarity that we have built during the coronavirus. So I'm very optimistic. That's great. It has a, the, it's interesting that even as difficult as communication is, in some ways it's even better and a little more open. It's, it, I think that's an interesting kind of side effect of how things have gotten to for us. Definitely, yeah. definitely. And last I wanna ask, so with all the things going on in the world these days, what are you hopeful for? Sure, so for me, I think the pandemic uh, serves as a great uh, wake up call mm -hmm. so that uh, for people, uh, the linear growth of GDP and so on um, kind of takes um, back us a little bit, but we can further develop the measurements of progress. The progress doesn't have to be linear. It could be actually the business and the society innovating together to achieve the global sustainable goals. And global sustainability sees to be there's something like a kind of linear development things where you take care of the basics and the developing world. And on the developed world, maybe you worry about, you know, open government and things like that. Uh, but rather we see digital now instead of just as information and communication um, innovation in the industry, we see it as partnership for the common goals that can unite the forces of the economic, the societal, as well as the environmental forces together. Because this is what was required to counter the pandemic. And we have this idea of cross-sectoral collaboration for a long time. But this is the first time that all over the world, people see it on the same urgency scale. Uh, in climate change, on smaller islands, it's more urgent. On larger continent, it's less urgent. Of course, that's the nature of things. But for pandemic, every epicenter is just two months away from every other epicenter. So this shared urgency timetable enables us to build uh, new infrastructures, sharing access, sharing research, sharing the communication infrastructure that enhance availability of reliable data across sectors, that encourage effective partnership across jurisdictions, as well as sharing open innovation, making sure that people, um, when we innovate something locally, we do not keep it to ourselves, but uh, spread it uh, with what we call the Taiwan model and in website like Taiwan can help that us. That was great. Thank you so much, Audrey, for talking to us today. And I just want to close out with how great it was to talk to you because it also is a reminder that even in times that are difficult, we can learn things. So what I'm also hopeful for is the fact that people are able to communicate better. And just, you're right, the idea that everything doesn't have to be business related. It can be for the greater good of each other and that we can share those things with each other. And guess what? We could have done this all along, but sometimes we need a little push so thank you again for taking the time to talk to us i really appreciate it thank you and live long and prosper thank you <laughs>